kind of talk a lot about how we do our work, what we do, but um, I'm going to emphasize today that I'm here today in Monkegan because um, I'm going to explain a little bit of this because of its offshore nature and its genetic isolation. And I'll, I'll go into that in quite a, a fair amount of detail. Um, so a little background, my name's Todd. I'm obsessed with historic apples. I've spent the last decade basically scouring the landscape, mostly of Hancock and Washington counties, looking for the oldest surviving apples um, in, in the region. Uh, we have found trees that are huge, 11 feet in circumference, that go back hundreds of years, likely, um, and are a direct connection to the oldest agricultural landscapes in Maine. Um, I say I blame my friend John Bunker and my mom. Um, John introduced me to heirloom apples several, uh, 14 years ago in Lemoyne. He was telling a story of an apple that he had tracked down um, in Lemoyne that is right close to my home in Ellsworth. Um, John has been doing historic apple preservation work basically for 40 plus years all over the state. So um, he sort of gave me that uh, extra push and I recognized that what he did was a kind of historical research, local historical research that really was rooted in place. It was place-based and really connected people to their own communities. I also immediately recognized it as basically one of the um, best ways that I could engage undergraduates in education about local history. Um, so those two things have really worked out spectacularly. I teach a class every fall called the history of agriculture, colon apples, we do apple mapping, People, the students learn, learn the history of apples in Maine. They do independent research projects. Um, and I've also been collaborating with John, and I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit, um, at the Maine Heritage Orchard. And I say also blame my mom. There's no blame to be had here, but um, my mom was an inveterate gardener, loved gardening. And um, in spite of being forced to work in the garden from a very early age, the story was actually that my mom would just leave me in a basket while she gardened because um, she just loved gardening so much. I grew up around azaleas in Atlanta, Georgia that she had propagated. Um, so I grew up in sort of a botanical wonderland, but as a kid really didn't particularly appreciate that at the time, um, particularly being asked to help with the various horticultural tasks. But that combination of the inspiration of John Bumper and the roots in gardening in particular that my mother provided for me, sowed the sort of, tilled the field so that I was ready when apples presented themselves to me. Um, one thing I should tell you about myself is I'm trained as a Latin American historian. Um, I teach at the College of the Atlantic, so I teach all kinds of hist history, but my professional training is actually on 16th, 17th and 18th century colonial Guatemala. So apples are something that I came to quite late. Um, and, it, and really I came to them as a result of this combination of the inspiration from John, um, from sort of my background in botany, but also because I teach at the College of the Atlantic and as long as I don't get too crazy, I can do whatever I want. And so this allowed me to pursue this uh, passion to develop it into a, a kind of a thing that I do that's probably the primary thing that I do academically now. John and I have been to England with students to look at cider culture in England and also to Northern Spain, which has the oldest cider tradition in America. I've also teach, taught a year long class called the Cider Project where students harvested apples, pressed apples, um, fermented them and did the whole sort of year round, um, year round uh, apple production thing. So, um, <clears throat> Really what has happened is my, my major work, what I consider my major contribution, both academically and, and in terms of the community has been basically focusing on the work of tracking down, researching and preserving Maine heirlooms fruit. And I wanna emphasize this preserving because <coughs> we can find these apples, but we have to preserve them. So 
one of the things that's really wonderful is my job at COA has provided a day job that has provided me with the opportunity to explore this passion um, sort of to the maximum. <clears throat> so what do I want? I am really interested in old, really old trees. And Monhegan has some of these, I believe. Um, and also the DNA of old, really old trees. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is a tree from Southwest Harbor. It's 11 and a half feet in circumference. Um, it is just on a farm, just um, 100 yards from some sound. And I would say that I thrive myself when I'm finding each year one tree like this, because you know that this is a direct connection to some of the oldest farmscapes in America. Um, and I have to say, when you see these, these mother trees on the landscape, there's just a sense of awe. A, that they survived, and B, that they still hold secrets for us that are um, palpable today and important for contemporary agriculture. And I'll talk a little bit um, more about that. So we're gonna collect, we've been collecting on Monhegan, little uh, DNA samples. Basically what we go around and do is we take vials full of silica, we take fresh leaves, we put them in here, and then we send them off to a collaborator, a friend of ours who, who works at Washington State University. They do gene genomic profiling, compare it to a data set, and it basically tells us what apple it is, if it's in the reference set, who its parents are, and potentially who its, its uh, relatives are, grandparents, um, siblings, that sort of stuff. So in some cases, and I make this distinction between really old trees and the DNA of really old trees, because this tree, um, which is on Fernal Point in, in Southwest Harbor, um, has propagated its genetics in the landscape through its children, its grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So on Manhegan over this weekend, what I'm hoping is to find out which trees like this used to be on the landscape here in Monhegan. Um, I've seen a lot of the trees on the island in my two visits, and I have not yet seen any of these really old trees. But the hope is that by collecting DNA, we can discover um, the genetics of those older trees, particularly, um, hopefully, the parents and grandparents. I believe, um, and I've been really interested in this question, where are the oldest trees in America and where might the, the DNA of the oldest trees in America be? And I've come to the conclusion that basically it's gonna be in sites that were settled or visited very early on where there's continuous settlement or interrupted settlement, but where there might be seedling trees that persist on the landscape. Um, I believe that Monhegan is among the places in North America. Um, Castine is one because the French are there very early. There are a few other sites uh, in Southern Maine where there's continuous settlement and the possibility of very, very old trees or very, very old genetics. Um, but first, let me talk a little bit about how we track down, rescue the oldest, rarest apples in Maine. Um, this is a picture of my colleague, Laura Seeger from the Maine Heritage Orchard at Mafka. Laura is the um, Maine Heritage Orchard manager and the Maine Heritage Orchard is a preservation collection of about 350 varieties that we've collected from all over Maine to basically reconstruct a collection of all the apples that we know were grown in Maine. When we're done, we know for a fact that something on the scale of 700 to 1,000 named varieties of apples were grown in Maine. So if we're lucky, we're a third of the way there. In America, between 1600 and 1920, there were 18 to 22,000 named varieties. 
So, and these are all the varieties that were found here and there that people gave names to. Um, there are 18,000 that have been documented by my friend Dan Bussey, who has written a seven volume history of American apples. And what our goal is to preserve everything that we know was grown in Maine. Um, we'll see if, you know, time and life and, and uh, energy and the resources to do so. So far, we have 350 varieties. We call them cultivars. It's a technical term that, that our geneticist uh, friends and, and fruit breeding friends sort of insist on. We've collected them from around the state. John Bunker collected many of them during his 40 something odd years. And he had them on a branch here and a branch there at his farm, Super Chili Farm in Palermo. But we've also, every year, we find anywhere from 15 to 40 new ones that we've never seen before. And so those come in, they go into a nursery, they get propagated, and then after they've grown out two years, they get planted in the heritage orchard. And we also have a stewardship program where individuals across the state will keep a copy of each apple in the preservation orchard um, in their homes to preserve them as well. So that if the one in the orchard dies, we have a, a backup copy. For me, this is really fun because every year we find new trees, like the one that I just showed you in Southwest Harbor that I found this year for the first time. Immediately we'll graft that, propagate it, and you know that you're passing it along to future generations. One thing that I'll say about this, the importance, even if you don't geek out about what were the thousand apples taught, what would they taste like? These are trees, many of them, that have survived over 150, 160, 180 years. And they've gone through climactic change, through drought. Many of those oldest trees would have been planted during what was called the Little Ice Age. So they were grown at a time actually that was four degrees colder than normal uh, in the last 150 years. So they're resilient. Um, they're agriculturally resilient to changing environment. And if there's one thing I think we all know is we need resilience in our agricultural systems. So the other resource for the heritage, um, the main heritage orchard is for the industry to preserve this genetic material so that it's available for future generations. <clears throat> we also document and research apples. Um, we build lists of what were grown by uh, county by county. Two of my students are here, Lydia Pendergrass, and Elizabeth uh, DeAngelis, and they're helping with this work. Lydia last year took all of the Bangor, Wigan, Courier uh, newspapers from the 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and compiled a list of everything that was grown in Penobscot County by the Bangor Horticultural Society, hundreds of varieties, some of them never recorded before in Maine except in those newspapers. So now we have a complete comprehensive list of everything grown around, um, around Bangor and Penobscot County. I've been working away on Hancock County for almost a decade. And to give you an idea, in just in Hancock County, so far I have over 200 varieties that were grown between roughly 1850 and 1920. In some cases, we know the variety, the town, the person who grew it, and when they grew it. So we do these wanted posters and they'll say wanted, um, Leland Pippin, last seen in Orland, Maine, 1917, grown by such and such. And often because of the resources that are available through the USDA, have these beautiful watercolors of them because they were sent in sometimes and painted by watercolor artists between 1880 and 1918. So we know what the apple looks like, we know it was grown, um, and so people can help us find them. We dig into archives, we read newspapers, we read the main pomological society records. Um, and as I said, um, we map and also collect DNA samples. So one of the things that's really great about the DNA is um, if I took this bottom, we collect leaf samples off, there are many apples that we would never know anything about. So DNA has come into sort of the world of research and added for us a completely new tool to allow us to know what is this apple? 
So we'll find a very old apple. For example, I found one down in Washington County, huge old tree. And we send off the DNA and back comes um, the, the, the parentage of this apple. And we know, for example, in that case, that that apple tree is the child of a very old English apple. So the question is, is this the first generation of apple that was, was grown here? So the DNA um, results basically provide a new archive for us to dig into. And it's been wonderful because our trees are probably the missing link between modern cultivars, many of which were bred and, and developed in the 20th century. And they're very genetically, uh, very ge genetically homogenous. And the, ours are sort of the older ones that are more diverse um, and they connect directly back to the English varieties. For example, we found one in, in Northeast Harbor. It's this incredible tree that basically spreads out across um, most of what this, most of this room, because it's, it breaks down, it roots, it sends up a tree, it breaks down. So it builds this tremendous colony. And that tree is directly related to two old English apples. So that's probably one of those founding generation apples we think may have been planted by John Manchester around 1760. So when you get that close, you, you are getting um, information that you would never know otherwise. So it's really, really exciting. <clears throat> so this new DNA archive um, allows us to determine the identity of the apple. Um, what is it? compared to 2,500 apples that are in our reference data set, it's an international data set. Um, so one of the great things is it'll just tell us that we don't have to guess anymore. And particularly John Bunker, who sits and stares at the apples for hours and hours and hours, tries to read all the descriptions that are possible. Um, it'll just tell us, is that a Ben Davis? Is it this, is it that? Um, and if it's not one of those 2,500, it's one of these rare varieties that we're looking for. We may never figure out what it is, but we know it's worth preserving. Um, the other thing it'll tell us, and this is a, a little sketch map that just gives you an idea of some of the work that we're doing. These, all these little boxes are apples that we've collected in Maine. And it tells us that these ones down here are all the grandchildren of an old French apple called Renette Franche the French Rainet. All of these apples go back to one mother, one great grandmother really, that is colorfully called unknown founder 13. <laughs> um, although I think we now know it's not, we haven't, it's not been released to the public yet um, because the, gen the geneticists who work on this have to publish these research, their, their research has to be peer reviewed. But we're hoping that within six months to a year, we'll actually know what this un unknown founder 13. But so you can sort of see here, um, for example, Black Oxford, which is an iconic Maine apple, one of the greatest apples that ever came out of Maine, we now know um, is a child of an old apple called Hunt Russet and another one called Blue Pear Maine. And we did not know that even a year ago, nine months ago. So this is the kind of stuff that we're but you can also see, so Hunt Russet is here. Hunt Russet is a child of René de Carme, who's a child of unknown founders. So we're beginning to build this amazing sort of family tree of all American heirloom apples and where our apples fit. And you can see here the little boxes, the little empty boxes. Those are the parents that we don't know or the grandparents that we don't know. So, um, this is an old apple called Great Hermain. This is an old apple called Sweet Russet. These are just my scrib scribblings. But these are all the apples in the, in the main heritage orchard and how they connect back to the original, essentially, great grandmothers, um, which is information that was basically um, <clears throat> inaccessible to us. At this point, we've profiled over 200 um, varieties for Maine. The information just comes in. Um, we, we're doing more this year. We're, we'll continue doing more. And what that allows us to do is to basically begin to fill in all of this, um, all of these boxes one by one, we hope. <clears throat> 
So I just want to remind everybody, this is one super important fact about what, what we do. Um, <clears throat> I didn't bring my apple. I, I brought an apple out here to cut open for you. But um, it is so important to understand that in order to get a Macintosh tree, you cannot plant a Macintosh seed. If you take a Macintosh apple and you cut it open and you take those 10 seeds out, every seed in that apple is genetically unique. You plant it and you get a completely new cultivar that has never existed and will never exist again. So Macintosh, this is actually, um, this is actually John Macintosh who discovered the uh, Macintosh tree in his orchard in Dundella, Ontario. Every Macintosh tree in the world traces its ancestry back to this one tree that this man found in um, the beginning, in the middle of the 19th century, beginning of the 19th century, and then grafted throughout Maine, New Hampshire, New York, throughout the country. So that the, the grafting creates the cultivars um, because seeds cannot propagate a cultivar. They're all genetically unique. And one thing that I always tell people is really just think with this. You take this Macintosh tree, every year it produces unique apples that never existed before in unique combinations. So every single seed in every single apple, every single year is genetically unique off of this Macintosh tree. So the diversity, the way that the fruit looks, how it tastes, the color, when it fruits, when it blooms, all of that diversity in malice species is really, really remarkable. And I think you probably have already noticed this around Monhegan, you can see it in the landscape. All of these seedlings, each one unique, that have never existed. So there, are, you probably, <laughs> you've seen them, right? Um, around, just around the village here, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of unique seedlings that are the children and grandchildren and the great grandchildren of apples that have been grown here historically. <clears throat> okay, so why am I here in Monhegan of all places? Um, the earliest European activity on this coast was drying fish, seasonally by fishermen from the Basque countries, Asturias and Galicia in Spain, and basically from the entire Atlantic coast of France, the Dutch, and some English fishermen. Um, Offshore islands such as Monhegan and Tunicus, and I put question mark, there are many offshore islands that were certainly used by European fishermen um, in, in Newfoundland and further north, also for whaling. Um, and one of the things, one of the big questions for us is, did they leave apples or apple genetics, right? So imagine a Basque fisherman, I'm going to talk about the specific timing of this, um, who gets off his ship, is eating an apple, throws it over his shoulder on Monhegan um, in 1512, and that apple begins to grow. So one of the questions that genetics allows us to ask, potentially, is, is anything here in Monhegan match collections in Spain, in France, in the Netherlands, in England, in Germany. Where did the genetics come from? Um, <clears throat> this is Champlain's early map, 1608, of the coast of Maine. But it's important to remember, um, just a little bit of background, um, that uh, Giovanni, who we call in English John Cabot, his name was Giovanni Caboto, um, came as an uh, English agent to discover the new world, quote unquote, in 1497. Within 10 years, Europeans are fishing on the coast of Maine and up into Newfoundland um, continuously from probably, we think, somewhere around 1508, 1510, continuously throughout the 16th century into the 17th century. So when Captain John Smith and comes to Monhegan in 1614, it's very likely that Europeans had been using Monhegan and other offshore islands 
for drying fish for up to 100 years. Um, and the interesting thing then is, you know, the first permanent settlements, the first durable settlements. This is why Monhegan, places like Castine, where the French were from 1634 onwards, are places that are quite interesting because they are probably some of the areas where it is likely that European apple genetics and apples were introduced. This map is quite, quite an interesting one. This is from 1634. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just show you the, the whole map. So you can see all the way from, you know, uh, Long Island Sound, Cape Cod, all the way up the, cap, the um, coast of, of Maine um, into, uh, into Canada. But one really interesting thing, so this is 17, uh, this is uh, 1734, sorry, map. And you can see, it shows you the outline of Monhegan. Um, these, are, these are both um, two, two views of Monhegan. And this, this coasting chart was basically to allow you to recognize where you were along the coast by being able to recognize the different, um, this is the Tinicus here, um, and this is Mount Desert Island, many of you will recognize that. Um, so it was a coasting map that basically said, here's, here's, where, um, here's where you might be on the coast. Um, <clears throat> this is a similar map from the same year, 1734. There began to be much better maps of the coast of Maine. Um, and interestingly, this map, if you zoom in, shows um, it's called South Lakes Island or Monhegan. And you see that on the southeastern shore, there's a habitation, there's a house. Um, this is quite interesting because the coast of Maine, after King, King Philip's War, so this major war between the um, Native Americans, French, and English, um, with, the, with the Native Americans fighting on the side of the French, explodes in the 1690s and turns everything north of the Kennebec into a zone of all-out warfare. And Monhegan was part of that. Um, but this map indicates that at least in 16, 1734, there was, a, there was a, at least a single house. And this map was meant to allow you to identify the island by which houses were visible from the shore. So we know that in 1734, there was a house visible on uh, Monhegan in 1734. And your own history, I mean, the history that's sort of told in the island end is that the next wave of settlement is 1784. That's the beginning of permanent settlement, certainly down in the village. Um, and um, each iteration of maps, you sort of are looking, do they, they know where it is, you know, who's living there. Um, <clears throat> so the real question, this is another apple, this is an apple from, um, from Ellsworth, from North Ellsworth, again, about 10 feet in circumference. This is a great tree. I don't know how well people online can see this, or if you all can see this, but if you look at this tree, it actually looks like a beech tree. It's kind of really stout, it's like a fire plug and has this really crenellated, um, this really crenellated um, bark pattern with all this bumpiness. Um, this is a guy who has an orchard up in that area. And I went up to ask him about a, a variety that they used to have. And he says, oh, we don't have that apple anymore. It, it washed out in, an old, in, a, um, in a big flood, you know, 20 years ago, but he says, have you seen this tree over here? And I've been up here three times and because it looks like a beech tree, I didn't even recognize it as an apple because it's so, so old. Um, <clears throat> so the thing that I'm really excited about here in Monhegan is do, can we detect potentially, because there are only probably five sites in New England where this is possible, do they have Basque or Norman, Spanish or French, potentially Dutch, potentially very old English DNA? Um, and if not, what do they have? Like, do we, are we able to detect across those hundreds of years um, who were the great grandmother trees that were on this island? And the great thing about this is it is that DNA archive that basically tells us um, if we have that 
you know, Dutch apple or that Spanish apple or that French apple will basically tell us, will answer that question for us. So thank you very much. I'm gonna make one suggestion. If you're super excited about this, um, you should check out this project called Registry of North America. Um, I'm just gonna show it to you really quickly. Some collaborators of ours are working on this. We're gonna um, try to connect this for you all through the museum so that you can see this. This allows you basically to map an apple anywhere in Maine, anywhere in the country, um, where you just enter the tree, you say where it is, you put it on a map, and then it will appear. And these are some of the apples that we've begun to, oops, sorry. We've begun to map down in our area. Um, here's some that are in prospect. Um, here's one <laughs> in front of my house in Nelsworth. <laughs> and the great thing about this is we have um, a whole registry dashboard where you can see, you can zoom in on an area. Come on, load up. You can zoom in on an area like Maine. So, so far we've identified through the registry 400 cultivars all over the country. Um, this actually tells you how we identified them. It tells you all the varieties that we found and you can just explore this on your own. But if you zoom in on the map, um, let's say, let's see, uh, well, there's not, <laughs> I won't zoom in on Monhegan because they're none here yet, but if you map them, there will be. Um, uh, so there we go, it's gonna reload. So that's, you know, Maine, Augusta, from Augusta sort of east. And this tells you, the, the registry dashboard tells you that we've already identified 70 varieties in this area and all the ones that we've identified. And so eventually we'll be able to add the trees that we've found here in Monhegan and when you look at a map of Monhegan, it'll tell you the, the cultivars that we've detected and, and how to get there. So this is really fun. I think um, I was talking to Jen. My hope is that I could call, come back in the fall and I'll be able to say, okay, we know what your apples are. Uh, cross your fingers. I thought we would have had that by now, but apparently I failed in my first uh, DNA sample collection. They couldn't extract the DNA for them. So we're back again. But I'm hoping that in the fall, we can come back, see some of the fruit as well, um, and then do a little talk. And I can, if, if we have time, we might be able to explain to people how you could do this. If you have any questions about it, um, there's a self-explanatory, um, you know, sort of walks you through how to do it. And if you're technologically interested, there's, a, there's an app that you can, you can download called Survey123, and you just enter the, enter the trees directly. Um, Lydia has done a bunch of work with the people in Colorado to help us develop these techniques. And eventually, you know, we have several hundred apples that we're mapping. Uh, and every time that we map trees, uh, when we're out doing DNA, they'll just appear on the map. Um, okay, so thank you. And now I'll take questions. Yeah, Tom. Um, I'm just curious whether you do just Richmond Island. Uh, <laughs> pretty long as uh, spent so much time civilizing that. Yeah, so Richmond is one of the other major candidates for this early settlement because it was a fish station like Monhegan. Um, and one of the things that we're basically trying to do is identify all of the sort of offshore islands. You probably know this, what we're looking for is a place that is too far away for a bee to fly. <laughs> so Richmond is, is definitely in that, in that category. Isle of Shoals is a similar one. Um, I'll be really honest, you guys are our guinea pigs. We're hoping that Monhegan is distant enough. So we're gonna start with Monhegan and Matinicus, um, <clears throat> that they're just distant enough. And there's also, um, my hypothesis is actually that the Basques are, tend to be farther north in Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and that we're hoping to detect the sort of lower, um, lower end of their occupation. And the reason that I'm so interested in this is, you know, you know that somewhere in that time period, 
somebody threw an apple overboard, even on that on a tree, because we see them all along the shore, and that some of those genetics persist. And it's not merely a curiosity, because one of the questions, for example, in Hallowell, um, Winthrop is sort of the one of the centers of gravity of the main orcharding industry. And we actually have an, a, tree or, a tree order from London from 1809 from Benjamin Vaughn from the Vaughn homestead of what trees he bought from London and then planted in Hallowell. So we know what some of the original trees that were planted and that were the basis of at least that regional um, orchard in, industry. And one of the questions is what else is along the coast? But yeah, Richmond Island is a great, a great suggestion. Thank you, yeah. Yes. So uh, I'm a neighbor to yours, which is Surrey. Oh, great. And I'm looking at the Institute for Education, which is probably. Uh huh, yes. And when we bought the property 25 years ago, there were six very, very old apple trees on a huge lawn. Huh. And we allowed the lawn to yep. get reforested. And now, I don't know, it's close to 50 apples. Uh huh. <laughs> so, so what, and, and now I understand. What I didn't understand before is why you want to do the same. Right. Um, but one of these trees is very old. Yep. The best apples I've ever seen are huge. Okay. And I, I'm <laughs> dying. Okay. So, and I feel like we should protect it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what should I do? You, you are in a. You are, okay. Yep. So the question is, um, so uh, a neighbor of mine close in Surrey from the Center for Human Ed Education has some old trees. They, they've sort of let the area come back a little while. There are lots of seedlings and they have one variety that they're particularly interested in protecting and propagating. And I was about to say, well, you won the lottery. You live within six miles of, of my four miles of my house. Um, I'd be happy to come look at the tree and see, but that's exactly what we do. We take sign wood off of that tree and we propagate it. And we make, how many do you want? Do you want five? Do you want 10? Do you want 20? And the idea is to get these apples back out into the community. And the other thing I will say that's really important. Okay, I'm obsessed with historic apples, but each one of these seedlings, you have to remember every um, every cultivar that ever existed was a seedling. And so your, all your seedlings in front of the center, uh, <laughs> that's gonna be some fantastic apples. All right, you're coming over. Okay, and, and, the thing, and the thing that I would say, I would tell you about this is in general, they have great ancestors. They have great apples in their, in their pedigree. And the bees have done this work for us, which is to create a dramatically um, diverse palette of apples. And I say one of the things that's great about the renaissance of these heirloom apples, there's just an apple for every palette, there's an apple for every use and an apple for every season. And if we can bring them back, then, you know, John Bunker always makes this joke. He says, go into Hanover and say, I want you all to get some great pie apples. All these apples you hear, have here, they're great dessert apples but I want a pie apple. And he says, the fruit manager's gonna look at you like you're an extraterrestrial, but we all want pie apples, right? And so the goal is to have these come back in a way that they're around. And the big one that you describe, you know, it's very funny. Um, I immediately say, oh, it's a Wolf River, right? So Wolf River is this really big um, red blush striped, beautiful striped red thing. And people adored them because you would just bake and then you would core it and bake it and then scoop it out with a little bit of maple syrup and cinnamon. And it was a, it was a meal. Um, and there's one just up the road here that um, Angela, um, Kathy Krause's daughter was telling me like, you know, you just take a couple of these and you, you have a pie. Oh, and, and Florence was telling me this about one of the pies. That she, that she had. So th what they're for, and I, yeah, I'd love to come over and look at them. And one of the things we'll do is then try to figure out what it is, particularly in the fall. And what you can do though, is send me a picture, just look me up. There's, there's one guy who teaches history at the College of Atlantic who looks like me. Um, and you can send me an email with a picture of the tree because one of the most important questions, is it a grafted tree? Is it a cultivar or is it a seedling? And so those pictures help us sort of determine whether it's 
clearly a grafted tree. A lot of times they'll, they'll have these beautiful lines around them and say, oh, it's a totally grafted tree. Um, and the reason that matters is then we won't look, if it's a seedling tree, we don't look for a name because it's, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it Surrey Delicious uh, because it's never existed before. It will never exist again. But if it is a cultivar, we'll want to preserve it and, and get it into the collection. And what we do is we give it a provisional name. Um, we, <laughs> Carrie and I found one up here at the top of the hill that we call Red Octopus up by the Lobster Cove Trail. As you walk up to the Lobster Cove Trail, you um, start walking down the trail. There's one on the left. We think actually it's one tree, but it has like 20, 20 stems on it and it grows a little bit like a lilac tree. It does not, it does not look like an apple tree. So um, we call that red octopus. And so we make up these colorful names just to remind ourselves of where they come from. Um, and then we'll put it in the heritage orchard with that provisional name until we figure out, uh, figure out the name. And one of the things, one of the benefits of working with us is if you find a tree, you get to name it at least provisionally. So we have all kinds of crazy names, unfortunately. <laughs> in the yeah, Carrie. Tell them why it's red. Oh, the flesh is red on that apple. It's, it's, it's tinged with red. And um, that's very unusual, obviously, in apples. Um, and that tree could be quite old, I think, because it's what we call a colonial form. It's like it's growing outwards as opposed to up. Um, it could be a very, very old tree. Um, even though we're accustomed to trees just get, you know, being single stemmed, big, fat, pluggy things. This one may be old just by sort of extending itself out. We found one very similar to that actually in Northeast Harbor, this one that I was, I was telling you about. So. Other questions? Yes, what? Were apples indigenous to Yes. So apples, the apples that we eat and adore have their origins in Kazakhstan, in Central, in Central Asia. Western China, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, so in Central Asia. In the high mountains of the Tian Shen, there are forests of apple trees, black walnuts, and apricots, which I wanna see. It's on my bucket list, like I wanna go to Kazakhstan. So the, the trees begin to come um, west and they go as well, but they come west to, to, to the Western world over about uh, um, several hundred years, we think, along the Silk Road. And as it comes, it's, um, so that species of apple is called Malus siversii, named after a guy named Siver, siversii. It picks up genetics from Turkey, Malus orientalis, and it picks up genetics from um, Western Europe, Malus sylvestris. So it's what's called an interspecific hybrid because it's, it's a combination of three, at least three species um, that's then brought to the Americas. In the Americas, we have native wild crabs, crab apples, um, but the closest one to us here in Maine is actually in um, Eastern New York, along the border with Vermont and um, Massachusetts. It's called Malus coronaria. We had, um, down where I grew up in Georgia, Malus angustifolia, little green things that are great for throwing at your brother. Um, and then out in the central plains, they have Ma Malus ioensis. It's also sort of a shrubby. So we have five species of apple, Malus, in um, the continental United States. Two of them actually are evolutionarily very, very old, but um, they, never really prop they never really develop into lots of species. China has 25 species of apples. So in their apples in Southern China, tropical environments, there, there are apples in the Himalayas, there are apples, you know, all probably 40 total species. And in North America, we have five. Most of them, I, I always say are edible, but not palatable. <laughs> so you could eat them <laughs> if you wanted to. And in, in, in the Northwest, there's actually a, a Malus fuchsia, which, um, uh, was eaten by Native Americans, but um, more as a medicinal sort of, it's a small apple like this was dried and then eaten uh, medicinally. It wasn't very tasty. However, Native Americans do adopt um, apple agriculture. The Cherokee were very 
into um, apple orcharding, as were the Iroquois. So there are actually a number of apples that come um, back into white society through the Cherokee. There's one famous one called Nickajack. It was discovered in Cherokee orchards after they were forced into the Trail of Tears. So um, some, some of those are very, very interesting apples because they would have been adopted probably by the Cherokees by, by about 1720, 1730, very early on. So those, those I'm actually quite interested in. I've been reading a little bit about those to understand if we could figure out the, the genetics. Um, so just for the people on, online, the question was about the, the species of, of native apples um, in North America. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you speak to how this now located apple data may be used by historians to think yeah. about human habitation? And yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I think slow and steady as we build this, these layers of, of data, um, what is really interesting about it is <clears throat> so Maine, I would argue, is probably genetically one of the more diverse places in terms of the Malice species, because we have introductions from the French, maybe from the Basques, maybe, you know, we don't know, from the English. Then we have 100 years of war, introductions by the English and French again, 100 years later. Then in the mid 19th century, Russian apples are introduced to try to um, bring winter hardiness to our apples. Canadian apples are coming south, um, some of them French as well. Um, and then actually waves of introductions that come back from the West into the East. So we have a very unique history. And then our orcharding industry collapses in the 1920s and 30s because of a, specifically because of the depression and a, a freeze in 1932, it killed one out of three trees in the state. So as we are able to geolocate with genetic data, we can actually reconstruct the introduction of apples to North America. We'll know within probably if, if we're if we succeed at this and do enough testing, we'll know about the introduction of apples probably within um, a 20 or 30 year range. And then we can follow the introductions of the apples into other regions over time um, that will allow us basically to reconstruct the history of human selection of apples in North America and Europe um, over hundreds of years. And one of the things that's really, really interesting about this, so I've, I was um, just telling Carrie earlier, I'm working on a book and one of the chapters is called Wandering Mainers. And I wanna follow Maine apples that go west and Mainers who go west and do they take their apples and then what happens with them? It turns out, although we think Maine is really, really important in, apple, in the apple world, very few Maine apples are widely planted outside of New England. Um, so it's quite interesting, you know, our beloved Black Oxford, it makes it out sort of into the market, but, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't really succeed in the broader, um, particularly westward expansion planting, plantings out there. And so one of the things that's really interesting is we'll be able by reconstructing this, I call this molecular humanities, you know, combining DNA with historical research, we may be able to tell a comprehensive history that we would not otherwise be able to have, have told. And, you know, it'll, it'll take us a while. <laughs> I'm a little bit, you know, it's a little daunting because it'll take, I think it'll take uh, a decade or more. But what's great about it is we can, working with others, so there's this national group that we work with now that's doing this work in Maine, Colorado, Idaho, Washington, um, Oregon, and California. So we have people, and then some people in, in Montana. And so we're beginning to build a national network where um, one of the things that happens, we have an apple, say, we call Colorfully. This is John Bunker's name. No, it's actually Russ Libby's name. Sorrento, because it's from Sorrento, very imaginative name. And Sorrento turned up in Colorado and in Washington state. So now we know it's a cultivar. Now we just have to figure out what it is. So it's allowing us to do some of that kind of reconstruction. And um, <clears throat> the mapping also, I believe, this like this registry of North America, 
allows people like you all to map the trees that you love um, that begin to allow us to see the sort of distribution of where they are. And then as, we, as if, if the DNA testing gets cheaper and cheaper, then eventually we'll have a lot more information on them. And I will say one of the things that fascinates me about what's going on in Monhegan, we were out collecting DNA. So we have 10 tubes, okay? Um, these are expensive to send off. So we have to be very selective. And as I said to, to Lydia and Elizabeth, I don't know, which ones should we do, right? Because you're looking at them for their bloom, for their bloom time, what they look like. Are, are they, do they appear really different from other apple trees? But if you go out towards Jamie Wyatt's place, there's, some, there's one tree that looks like a fig tree. It just looks nutty. And you say, what is going on with this tree? So we collected a sample from that tree. And it's not a very old tree. Well, it does not appear to be an old tree. It could be an old tree, but it, look, it appears to be quite a young tree. But it has genetics that are just really unusual. So one thing, the other part that I think with the geolocation is, and the reason that Cameron Peace at Washington State that we work with is interested in this, is we're finding a lot of really weird stuff that could be valuable for breeding apples for resilience and, and long-term adaptability. So, yes. How much is the DNA? <laughs> um, so the way that. Pardon? And how you do Yes. Um, so uh, it costs about one hundred and twenty dollars, one hundred and seventy dollars, depending on the the service that we use. And how we're putting it, we're asking help, people to help us. We've been doing a bunch of fundraising for years now, um, soliciting contributions so that we can do it. Um, we have um, been working with different um, constituencies as well to raise money to do this, but mostly through the main heritage work. Um, I was on the board of Mafka for many years and I told them I no longer wanna be on the board. I wanna be on the fundraising committee so that we can raise money, both to, to preserve the orchard, because the orchard is, you know, now we have 350 headed towards 400 varieties, and we've made a commitment to take care of them forever. It's no small feat. So we're trying to raise money for that. And then each year, basically, we're doing solicitation to, to allow us to do the testing for that year. Um, and it's, you know, one of the things that I would say in general about it is, <clears throat> um, we take really unique places, like Monhagen is, is obviously one of them, and we turn them into um, case studies. Sorry. Um, so we're basically doing fundraising to allow us to, to do this work. And we launched a new collaborative between the College of the Atlantic and Moscow to allow us to fund this research in the longer run. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced, I'm, I'm, uh, I tell people in terms of this kind of, I'm a pathetic optimist, that this idea of molecular humanities, the kind of work that would be uh, particularly attractive maybe to the NSF and other um, uh, funding agencies. Um, so each year, basically, we try to do between 100, um, some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100, 100 tests a year. So, you know, just uh, if you're interested, you can um, And then if you're in cell, contact me and we can put in. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question about the uh, About what? Southern Maine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I have uh, a very old tree. Yep. John Buckers in town. Okay. Yep. And I can suggest to um, the woman here one thing I did was have a grafting party for my uh -huh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and he showed us how to yep. have the science and put the science with it on our new stuff. And I got trees planted. Right. So I've got one tree that has black ox fruit yep. and red to seven, and you can see the grass It's <laughs> great. Old. Yep. And the other tree is all red. Uh huh. So um, I do know those, but I'd love to verify. Yep. So 
Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, be in touch. So we actually just did one today that John had identified out here as potentially Chenango strawberry. And since you've met John, John is under tremendous pressure to tell people what they have. And it turns out that, um, that he is not infallible. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things that we found out by doing the test, there are several that we've collected along the coast actually just um, that we tested that, that um, turned out to be Rhode Island green, um, which is very common, but they're, they're different, uh, what are called sports of the, of the tree. So they look different from Rhode Island green. So yeah, we can, we can definitely test them. And I think that when you talk about Southern Maine, um, almost because of John's work, we know what we know, but John has been focused much in central, central Maine and Northern Maine. I've been focused in Hancock and Washington counties and Southern Maine is actually a target area for us because, um, because of the continuous settlements of certain sections of Southern Maine, uh, where we suspect as well. The one thing about Monhegan, so Southern Maine is continuously having new cultivars introduced. And I think the number that were introduced here in the genetic isolation gives us a chance of discovering things that we wouldn't discover otherwise. But absolutely, um, one of the things that we're starting to try to do, um, <clears throat> and I don't really know how to say this, um, but so I'm, I'm a historian, I'm, I'm super systematic about this. And so I sat down with John and said, okay, John, we have to do Southern Maine. <laughs> it's like enough of Waldo County, you know, there's all these old trees. How are we gonna do it? Who's gonna do it? So part of this is just figuring out how to, how to, um, how to create the staffing so that we can send people to do more of this mapping, but also include local communities. I'd love to come down and, you know, I'm, John would do the same, come down and do a talk like this about Southern Maine because every place in Maine has these stories. Um, and whether it's the DNA solution or whatever, you know, that's, yeah. So, yeah, Tom. Do the ships uh, coming in the 16th and 17th century reveal anything about their <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that's really funny about the early, early fishing is at least initially they didn't want anybody to know where they were because they had just discovered the mother load of cod. And so often the Basques would say they were going fishing in Norway. Um, and that didn't last very long. Word got out um, pretty quickly. But um, those ship's logs <laughs> in the Basque country are written in Basque. <laughs> so actually I've been reaching out, I've been trying to reach out to um, some Basque researchers about what kind of documentation uh, is, is existing. And one of the problems of course, right, is that it's, it's um, all of coastal France, you know, coastal Spain, coastal England, where are the places that we would have these, these sources? And to be honest, that's one of the second steps is to connect the sources with some of these, these. But one of the things, you know, I mean, a lot of people who came to Monhegan didn't want anybody to know they were here. They were privateer, private, privateers. They were, you know, fishing Dutch. The Dutch used this area a lot sort of between the French and the English. As, as bases of operations. They attack Castine, we think, from this area. Um, so yeah, it would, be, it would be great to be able to do some more, um, some more you know, actual archival research. And you know, one of the things that we're really trying to do is come up with a comprehensive list of everything that's known to have been grown in Maine, and then try to connect it through the DNA and, and archival resources. But yeah, that, that's, a really great, that's a really great question. And for people online, the question was about um, archival sources about the ships that came here. And, you know, my answer is um, the people who wanted you to know they were here, maybe there, <laughs> maybe there are some sources. Uh, one last question, maybe, since it's getting dark. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the question is um, from John, and she says, I always hear lots about historic apples, but it's rare to hear about historical or other fruit, even though I know they exist in many centuries past. 
why do you say that it's Apple, Apple stop, get the stop? <clears throat> okay, so we actually have some colleagues who are starting to work on historic pairs. Um, so I think the answer to that, there are, two, there are several answers to that, but I'll give you one answer. People love apples. People absolutely love apples. There's this sort of emotive a connection that people have with apples that I've never seen anybody have necessarily in the same way with pears. We find a hundred, for every hundred apple trees we find, we'll find one pear tree. So there is in fact here on the island, an apple down Dead Man's Cove, or a pear down by Dead Man's Cove that I believe to be very, very old. Um, so we are working with the USDA collection at Corvallis. This is um, some colleagues of ours who are really familiar to do some genetic sequencing of pears in Maine to see to discover what can be found out as well. Um, plums were all bred in Maine. Bangor was an area where people were breeding plums and they, they their pears from Maine, their plums from Maine. From, from Maine, but the plums do not um, exist in the landscape. They don't persist in the landscape, but they're quite difficult to find uh, those that material. So one of the things, and this is actually part of why we're working nationally, is it's possible that Maine pears exist and plums exist somewhere else in the, in the country. So we've been looking for one apple that came up from Massachusetts to Maine called Triangle, but it was also planted in Ohio and other places. So a lot of times our, our things that we're looking for are in other parts of the country. Um, and I would say there are people who are fanatics about mulberries, there are people who are fanatics about plums. So if you look at the North American Fruit Explorers um, group, they'll, they have people who do support other fruit. But it's true, apples get the sort of um, first billing. Other questions from, from online? Um, um, same person <laughs> writes, do you know of any resources that we can find out what type of pair we have? I bought a property with an excellent pair but no clue as to the variety. Um, so they can just be in touch with me. So my, friend, my friends and colleagues, Lauren Cormier and Dan Newman, are sort of the pair pair obsessed people in our in our network, and they would be I'm sure they'd be interested in looking. We we do keep an eye out for them, so occasionally we'll find old pairs. There's one from Winterport. We have several of these in the Maine Heritage Orchard as well, so we're definitely interested in old pairs from around Maine. Um, uh, so they can just be in touch with me, and then I can put them in touch with uh, with Lauren and, and Dan. Who are working directly with the USDA to do some genetic sequencing of this as well. We have I had hoped to collect leaves from this, but you have to keep them on ice and overnight them. <laughs> and I said, I don't think there's overnight service for money again. So we're gonna try to figure out the logistics of because I think it's actually one of those things where we'd have to take it off in a little cooler and then send it to, to Oregon. So we're working on that. Pablo, you had a question. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was trying to find a tree around here that I could point to you, point out to you that you could see a graft line on a tree. It's quite difficult to, to find them here because of the, I don't know if it's the, the most of them are seedlings, but sometimes you'll see this very dramatic line around the tree, often sort of between hip height and chest height. Um, on the older trees, sometimes right at the grassland. And one of the things I always tell people, <laughs> when you think about it, the graft is, is creating a scar. So you're looking for sort of, for sort of a scar line that goes around the tree. <laughs> Maybe one last question? Anybody? There's a question from online that says, um, when, oh, and, and another one just came in, so I uh, lost the first one. It's, was about when you graft, when you um, propagate varieties. Do you mean that you? Um, ah, <laughs> I lost it again. Um, do you mean that you graft them onto the rootstock, or are they grown from their own roots? So we graft them on the 
extremely winter hardy rootstocks so that they'll survive um, standard trees. Um, <clears throat> basically the idea is we collect cyanwood in the winter and then we, for all of the old ones that we're trying to preserve, we'll, we'll graft between five, uh, three to five, sometimes 10 individuals of that tree to make sure we get it propagated. And then one will go into the heritage orchard and several will go into the stewardship program so that people can keep them. So yeah, we grow all of them on um, standard rootstocks. Um, Antonovka is the one that's a very, very winter hardy uh, Russian one. And um, it would be interesting in a, in a you know, long, longer term to, to grow some on their own roots. Uh, we use the rootstocks basically to make sure they have a little bit of, of disease resistance and then um, longevity. What was the other question? The second question? Um, was it more common to graft trees to get particular varieties or did they just plant multiple seedlings and hope for good habits? Yes. Yes. People did everything. And I think one of the things that I always tell, that I always say um, in my classes is, um, <clears throat> We know a tiny fraction of what people did, but certainly people planted seedling orchards for cider. Then they would notice one apple was particularly good and then they would, might propagate, they might graft that onto five or 10 of the trees. Every, or every farmer, every household had some apple trees, had some apple trees. Some would have been seedling trees. Um, most would have been, um, most would have been selected cultivars that they were propagating. And I was saying to Florence earlier today, there's some apples that we know more or less probably were grown on three or four farms. They didn't, they didn't move beyond the orbit of the families that selected them. And there are other trees that would be grown all over the state. So black oxford becomes very famous in Maine at least. It doesn't make it very far, much beyond Maine, but certain parts of it. Um, Cole's quince is another apple that makes it out, for example, to Nebraska. Um, so um, what I tell people all the time is there's a diversity of farming practices and you would see almost over particularly 100 years or 150 years. One thing that you did see is an increasing pressure to specialize in a specific number of apples. By 1927, the extension agents have this thing they call the New England seven, um, that they want farmers to only plant seven varieties. And that's where we get Macintosh and Portland and Rhode Island Green become so prevalent, but farmers did whatever the hell they wanted to. <laughs> and most of the orchards would have had, at least up until the 20s, 30s and 40s, would have had dozens and dozens of varieties. So. Well, thank you all, everybody for coming out tonight. It's great to see you. Thanks.